Hello, my name is Arlene. I uh, am going to tell my story. Um, the nature of the story, of course, according to the title, um, Satanic Ritual Abuse. Uh, I'm going to tell my life story, and I think it's important right now because um, although the nature of what I'm talking about is very serious and um, very hard to hear, I believe that as an entire world community that we're at an opportunity to make some serious changes um, and save a lot of pain. Um, we've had our heads in the sand for a long time and that's including me. I mean anything that I say on here about about how uh, how we presented ourselves as the human race I'm including myself. Okay, um, I really believe that as a whole we've been brainwashed our planet's been hijacked, um, and we have an opportunity at this point in time to actually realize it and correct our mistakes and create a new world. So, although it's a dark story, um, my hope is that it's unto light, you know, unto hope. And uh, there are a lot of children that have been rescued, there's a lot of children that need to be rescued from the sex trade. You know, also involved in satanic ritual abuse, um, and I'm I'm here to speak for them. I'm here to speak for them and the adults um, who cannot speak for themselves. So I think um, the world at large does need an education on some of the things that have been happening behind the scenes for many, many, many years. Um, so here's my part. Um, so. <clears throat> I'll start at age 27, which is about 20 years ago. <laughs> um, I had just gotten married for the second time. It was a real wedding versus when I got married at 19. Um, I already had two children. Uh, my husband had two children and we came together and we had one right away. Um, right after we got married, you know, I had the whole wedding, you know, white dress down the aisle. Um, at that time I had become a Christian, so uh, I was church going weekly, two, three times a week. Um, so right after I got married, probably within a couple of weeks, two, three weeks to a month, I started having uh, what I came to know were flashbacks. But there were these, there were these memories, that, these scenes that would pop into my head that were horrific. Um, and they had to do with when I was a teenager. So it was really confusing. Um, I seemed to be emotionally um, affected by them in a really big way. So I started to go see a therapist. Um, and, you know, from there, just it took, you know, over a year, two years to really figure out what was going on. Um, I thought I was going crazy. I didn't want to believe that these were memories, that these things actually happened. Uh, I would rather think that I was crazy. But um, it's what it really came down to, is that I had to accept the fact that these things did happen and it was time to deal with it. So I went on a healing journey. I still did not know exactly what was going on with me. I had a lot of emotional uh, ups and downs outbursts, anger, rage, uh, but as I worked through, um, as I began to deal, um, another truth came out, and that truth was that I had uh, multiple personality disorder, is what it used to be called, and now it's called dissociative identity disorder. I had eight active personalities, there were more, but those were the active ones, and uh, I had to go down that journey. So, um, the thing of it is, is that um, my family was not supportive. I, I, I had come to realize that uh, a lot of stuff had happened earlier in my childhood, which I don't have very many memories of. I have a lot of memories from when I was a teenager. Um, I was, you know, a typical teenager. You know, uh, from Detroit, Michigan. I got in trouble just like any other kid, you know, smoking pot, um, messing around with boys, 
drinking, sneaking out, you know, all those kinds of things. And, you know, in the 80s, it was a lot more lax. I mean, if you got caught by the cops sneaking out or anything like that, they just simply brought you home to your parents and let your parents deal with you. Nowadays, you know, you, you go through the whole gamut of, you know, as if you're an adult going to go to jail. You know, I mean, it's, fines are unbelievable. Uh, but back then, it was a bit more lax. But um, I was no different than uh, my three brothers. I have three brothers, no sisters. Um, in my family, I was the only girl, and uh, because of my mom's ethnicity, the background is that the boys are usually the more prized ones. Uh, my father is uh, Polish, white, from Detroit, and so I wasn't surrounded by the our ethnic community. But um, clearly, clearly, um, my brothers were favored, and so. Uh, throughout my childhood, um, you know, I just thought, I thought certain things were normal. And I just want to say this, um, because, you know, one of the reasons why I hadn't brought this out yet was because I was afraid of implicating my family. But, you know, I just want you to know that, uh, you know, I, f I forgive my family. And uh, I really believe that they were victims as well. Um, I don't even think that they realize what's going on either. Um, but, but what I'm about to tell you about my family is just an example of um, how we keep our heads in the sand and how society helps us to do that and how we've come into agreement with those that have mind controlled us. Because if we don't become aware, if we don't know what's happening, we can't come out of it. And if we can't come out of it, we, we are headed down a road where we are all screwed. <laughs> and I don't believe that's going to happen. I really, really don't. Because um, I, I believe in humankind, and I believe that we are changing things, and it's going to take a long time, but we are, we are, we are, we have the spirit for it. So, anyways, um, my parents were abusive. Um, a lot of pe people's parents at that time were abusive. Um, my, my father was severely abused as a child. He just did what he knew. You know, he just, he came from a very narcissistic family, very cold. And, you know, he just thought that was normal. And, you know, my mother, I don't know too much about her background. I know she came from loving, a loving family, very poor. Um, but, you know, she just, she had my dad. She didn't have her family around. And so, you know, my mother became narcissistic in a lot of ways. Um, we become a, a narcissistic society in a lot of ways. <laughs> but, you know, they just handled things the way they thought they should handle things. And my father was very serious. Um, you know, when he spoke, we shut up. And uh, there were consequences, you know, physical consequences if we did not respect and do exactly what we were told. Um, on the other hand, with my mother, I, I have always felt like my mother hated me. I always felt like she hated me. Not just because, you know, uh, the whole ethnic thing with the, the, the boys and girls in the family, but... Um, I just always felt that way. Always felt like she targeted me. Um, I don't know, you know, if that's just underlying from what's happened to her. I have no idea. But this, I'm just saying my experience. This is my experience. Um, so when I was a little girl, I peed the bed. And often. I got kidney infections quite often. Uh, which now, you know, doctors would know if a child has kidney infections over and over again, they're probably being molested. Uh, back then, I don't know. I don't know whether they knew that or not. Um, but uh, it was embarrassing. But my mother treated it as, as, it, as if it was a surprise every time I peed my pants or peed my bed. Um, she got very angry with me as if I did it on purpose. Um, you know, in, in growing up, I grew up in fear, in fear of my family. And uh, so, you know, like one time I, I peed the bed, I think I was like eight years old, and my mother made me, she put a, a um, dishcloth on me as a diaper with, with those large diaper pins and made me walk around when my brother had his friend over to spend the night. I mean, that was a punishment because I peed the bed again. So... You know, um, also, when I would uh, get a really bad kidney infection, my temperature would go all the way up to 105. 
almost every time. And you'd think that after a while, um, you'd think that after so many times, um, you know, you'd expect that, that or ahead of time take me to the hospital or the doctors. But every time it got to 105, um, I got to go in the tub with lots of ice. It was very traumatizing. And it seemed like my mother would wait until um, I got to 105 so she could stick me in that ice water. I mean, I really felt like she disliked me greatly. Greatly. Um, like I said, you know, I don't know if that's just because of what happened to her. I think a lot of times we, we, we have underlying feelings and we don't know where they're coming from. We don't. We just, uh, you know, uh, baby boomers don't deal with, with anything. They don't deal with shit. <laughs> You know, they, they believe you just buck up and, you know, deal. You know, you just deal with whatever. Um, I come from the generation where we began self-help and, and getting help. So, <clears throat> anyways, um, I always felt like I was different in my family. Um, I understand now that I was a scapegoat. Um, I spoke up, whereas my brothers didn't. My brothers were, you know, more obedient and didn't speak out. I spoke up a lot. Um... So, you know, I'm a Libra, <laughs> and I'm also empathic, and, you know, I would say things like, you know, this isn't right, or, you know, why are we going to talk about it, because, you know, it's not for the point of understanding anything, it's just so that, you know, you can humiliate me, and I can get my punishment, just give me my punishment now, I mean, I would say things like that, you know, so, you know, I was very arrogant to my family, my brothers would get upset with me, and they would say, just shut up, you know, Arlene, just shut up, you know, so, <clears throat> you know, I had a diary, and I wrote things down in my diary. I was promiscuous, even at 12. At 12, I was smoking, I was drinking, I was trying pot, you know, I was messing around with boys. Um, and I wrote that stuff down. My parents raided my room and, you know, invaded my privacy, read my things, and went through my things. Um, growing up in my house, um, I was told uh, I, repeatedly how stupid I was. And, you know, why couldn't I get it together, and why couldn't I learn anything, and how dumb was I? So, you know, I was very insecure. Um, but uh, when I, I was just about turning 15, and my parents told me that they were tired of dealing with me and that they were going to send me to a home. They just didn't want to deal with me. They were just going to get rid of me. And, you know, I think in their minds they were just trying to scare me, but, I mean, that was devastating. I mean... To have your parents say that you're not worth anything anymore and that they want to get rid of you because you're too much trouble. I, I, don't, I don't think they understood the impact of those words. Um, but instead, what my mother arranged was for me to go stay with a relative in another state. So she brought me there and, um, you know, that relative was pr quite uh, promiscuous. I mean, permissive, you know, permissive. I could smoke there. You know, I could drink, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I was excited to be there. And so, um, and I had three cousins who were, who were girls, so it was nice to be around girls. And so I was excited to be there. But there were some things that started to happen. And I, and I realized today that I was being groomed. I was being groomed for some things. Um, this, this relative, I believe, abused me when I was younger. You know, although at the time I didn't remember anything. Um, he paid a lot of attention to me, and I thought it was odd, actually. Even at the time, I thought it was really odd because, you know, his wife didn't make a big deal out of it, the fact that he spent a lot of time with me. Um, we would go to the gym together often, sometimes nightly. Um, you know, he, he was, uh, he had special abilities. I mean, he could speed read, he could, you know, do all kinds of things. Uh, he taught me to astro project, um... He, you know, often hypnotized me for fun. Um, you know, but he, he would start to ask me to do things like, you know, we would go to the gym and then afterwards we would go in the pool and he would ask me to hold his, his bicep. And I'm like thinking to myself, this is my relative. I, I don't want to do that. But, you know, I did what he asked me to do. I mean, he let me stay at his house and he was permissive. And, but he was definitely grooming me. Um, there were, there was psychological warfare, um, things that, I mean, mind games that I couldn't get out of eventually. You know, it started to go backwards after a while, and, and, and I, I was very confused um, as to what was going on, and, um, 
you know, I spent a year there, and after a year I went home. Now, when I went home, uh, I don't remember the plane ride home. I had scattered memories. Um, I knew something really bad happened, but I couldn't quite remember. So, but when I got home, um, I was 16, and I did not want to go and stay with my parents. I knew what that was going to be all about. Um, so, you know, I went to the party house where I, we used to hang out, um, where these older people would, you know, let's party there. And when, when after a, a while of, you know, staying on the couch there and hanging out and partying, uh, I got pregnant. Uh, I ended up moving into an apartment with a couple of the guys and, and worked at a car wash until I was seven months, you know, seven and a half months pregnant and my water broke and I had the baby early. I didn't want to go to my parents' house. I wanted to keep the baby, but I didn't want to go to my parents' house. But I realized that I could not take the baby to the party house. So I ended up trying to go back to my parents, but my mother was, oh my God, I mean, right here, 24-7, and I couldn't do a thing right. I couldn't change a diaper right. I mean, she, you know, my, my daughter was premature, so she was hooked up to a machine because she could stop breathing. She had sleep apnea. Um, but my mother was right here 24-7, and I, I just, I, nobody could handle that. I mean, you know, being a teenager, definitely not, but, I mean, nobody could handle somebody right there criticizing your every move. Now... You know, at one point before I had her, uh, I, I had decided that, you know, and actually a smart thing for a teenager, I couldn't take her to the party house, I didn't want to go to my parents, and I had decided that, you know, instead of keeping her out of love for her, I wanted to give her up for adoption. I did not want her to stay in the family. I knew I was not mature enough to take care of her um, without the proper support, or even then, I don't know. But... Um, my daughter uh, was, you know, born, and, and it was very difficult. I made this decision. Well, I actually, I made this decision afterward. I'm sorry. After I had her. It was right after I had her, and I'd gone to my parents. But um, my parents took me to court and took custody of her until I turned 18. And then I could decide. Well, by then, I wasn't going to give her up. So um, at that point, I left my parents, left her with my mother, and said, you know, whenever I can figure it out. My mother was angry, and I said, well, you, you know, you wanted to keep her, so she didn't really want to keep her. Um, so she really didn't want to take care of a newborn again, but she did, and she, we made a deal that, you know, when I could take her, I would take her. So, um, anyways, you know, I was... 18, I had a, you know, almost 19, I had a two-year-old, I moved out of state, got married to my first husband at 19, I mean, I had no business taking her, I knew nothing about taking care of a child, I was a stripper, so the day I turned 18, I became a stripper, stripper, I was just trying to survive, I didn't know what I was doing, so, um, anyway, coming back to, um, 27 years old, and uh, these memories coming out. Um, because my uh, relative hypnotized me, um, this is part of why I didn't remember. Um, but the things that were coming to my mind, the very first memory I had was I, I could see myself on a bed, and on the bed I was dressed in white clothing, there were roses around the bed. There were four posts, but they were cut off, and there were uh, black candles on each post. And I looked like, you know, I look, I laid there looking kind of like I was in a casket. Um, it's kind of fuzzy, but um, but seeing in that in in that uh, memory, I'm seeing from the ceiling, like like as if I'm looking in this from the ceiling down at myself. And later found out that, you know, I had, I, because of what had happened, I had left my body and um, there was a, what they call a fragment. 
So um, I had eight active personalities, but this was what they call a fragment, and it was just like a part of me was stuck in that memory at the ceiling. So that was the first memory, and then there were other memories. Um, in those memories, uh, I could clearly see what was happening. Uh, so I'm with my relative, and we're always at this beautiful house. I mean, rich people. I mean, big, beautiful houses. And it seemed like in the basement there was always this custom-made area for their rituals, for their festivals, or whatever you call them. Um, so in one memory, um, I am, there's like this, it's almost like a bathroom, but it's in the open. And I don't know. I don't know what what this was, and I only remember excerpts, but very clearly. Um, but it was just many people, many naked people, and it was like this. We were like scrunched up up against each other, and we were dancing, moving, uh, almost like zombies. And there was blood everywhere, and it was like it was a smear of blood everywhere, um, and and and. And the people were, were smearing it all over each other. It was almost like this ecstatic, dancing, um, erotic thing over this blood everywhere. Um, so that was one memory. Another memory was where, um, I believe I was being trained, um, but I'm on a cement floor and there are many metal buckets, many, many lined up, and they're all full of ice water. And so I would be raped, and then the bucket of ice water would be thrown over me. And then I would be raped again, and then a bucket of, you know, ice water. And this happened over and over again. Um, that was another memory. Um, there were memories of people in black, um, hooded black robes um, and rituals um, on a high, high table with a black cloth over it, among other things. Um, the worst memory was, um, well, I'll tell you this memory beforehand. Um, my relative had, um, some property. So there was, like, some forest area. And I'm sure we went there, and this is one of the memories. But in the memory, it's like, um, it, there were people holding, I don't know if they were torches, but there was fire. They were holding fire. And in my memory... And I don't know, you know, if I was drugged or what, but because um, my memories can be very fuzzy, but clear, but fuzzy. You know what I mean? Not full on memories. But um, in this memory, I'm on my back in the grass and there are people around me and there's fire. And someone's pulling something out of me. And I can't tell, you know, it's like for one second, it looks like an umbilical cord. And another second, it looks like a, a snake. And so... You know, that was a confusing one, but, um, but very clear, and I, my feelings, it was like, it was like I was there, and it was happening, right then and there, when I met, remembered it. It's called abreacting, I guess, you know, uh, that's what the psychiatrists call it. But, um, so, um, in another memory, I'm standing in front of the high altar, and there is a very tiny baby on the altar, and, um, uh, I have a, a dagger in my hand, and it was very ornate, and it had lots of jewels on it. And someone is standing behind me with a black cloak on, with the hood, and they're holding the knife in my hand and uh, made me stab the baby. And uh, that was the most difficult memory, because I really believe that that baby was mine. I don't know where that comes from, but I really believe that. And so... You know, when the memory started to come up, one thing that would happen would be I'd be driving down the freeway, and I could swear, I could swear that I could hear a baby crying in the back. That I, I literally have to pull over to check. I mean, there was a lot of um, grief with that. Um, there were other memories, but I'm not, I'm not going to go into those. But those are some examples of you know, at, at 27, some of the things that were coming up in my mind that I'm just like, wait, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm, I must be making it up. I must be crazy. 
but you know it's interesting once I started to actually accept the fact that these were memories that's when things kind of went bonkers <laughs> I mean in a good way because I couldn't really heal until everything came up and out and that's you know that's the hard part of when you're willing to do the work within when you're willing to get better um, you know you have to allow the the muck and guck to come out and up and out to deal with it and this is an, an aspect that most people can't deal with you know family friends or just strangers even you know because we we have been so trained to be afraid of one another and you know and you know to mind our own business to um, you know just really keep to ourselves um, and there's a lot of people out there that are you know in the throes of dealing with their stuff or just stuck in the throes of um, having their muck and guck at the surface and it never goes anywhere you know people who can't get help or don't know where to get help or you know got hurt and uh, you know we need to not judge people we need to not judge people yes we have to judge for ourselves you know um, what we can handle and you know who, who, who will be helpful to but you know we can always be kind I mean it costs us nothing and we can always send out a prayer for people you know we can't help everybody but you know we can be kind and not treat pe people like they're worthless or you know that they don't that they're weird or that they don't deserve anything just be kind people okay um, so you know my my husband was not supportive he did not believe me he did not believe I had multiple personalities he did not want to deal with any of it it was just kind of like here's the money go get better and you know he was very narcissistic very covertly narcissistic so you know he, he seemed like a really nice guy but behind the scenes he was not he was not kind to me I mean you know if he couldn't control me you know when my son was born our son was born um, you know I realized that he didn't love me and I wanted a divorce even though I was in therapy and basically he looked me straight in the eye and said you know if you try and divorce me um, I will take you to court and take the kids from you and being in therapy and the, the severity of it you know I, I was afraid of that so you know I mean our marriage began you know within the first year um, year and a half uh, on bullshit and you know he he didn't discipline the children he didn't allow me to discipline the children he disrespected me he took my authority away he wouldn't let me you know he wouldn't let me tell them that they couldn't wear a bikini at 11 years old that was too small I mean you know things things practical things I wasn't I wasn't allowed to um, to do anything you know and so you know I became very separate from my family and just you know I always thought in my mind I always thought immaturely that you know if I just did the hard work and I got better that they would accept me that he would accept me and that, that you know they the kids would accept me but you know I didn't realize that um, you know he was grooming them too and you know my kids didn't have any compassion for me I mean they you know they felt like he felt and I just simply got in the way of their freedom because you know, I, I wanted them disciplined properly. I mean, I, I didn't want my kids going through what I went through, especially my girls. And so, you know, just a really messed up, dysfunctional family like many of us come from. You know, this world has been dysfunctional for a long time. So, <clears throat> anywho, um, at that time... Um, As I was working hard, working through my stuff, um, and you know, I got the diagnosis for DID, and I actually got a second one as well um, down the road because at first I, I rejected it because I, I I had read up a little bit and I thought, you know, that's not that can't be because you know my mer memories come from when I was a teenager and you have to be under seven, you know, but those memories hadn't come up yet, so um, by the time I got my second diagnosis, I I understood, so. Now, not only am I dealing with, you know, what happened to me, but um, the personalities. And I was so afraid of them coming out in front of people. And, but, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's a system. And 
you know, people don't understand that um, DID is not a biological situation, meaning um, like schizophrenia, it's a biological issue in the brain. You know, there's something that's off in the brain and, you know, it needs to be treated because of that. Whereas dissociative identity disorder is a, um, it's genius. It's a survival skill. And I believe it's God-given. You know, it, it's, <clears throat> it's the genius to come up with a system to survive. Because children under seven have not learned how to cope yet with difficult things. And when you are abused uh, regularly, um, you know, um, it's consistent, persistent, um, it's a gift, you know, so that you can put that away and, you know, it can be dealt with when you're an adult, you know, and um, many things can trigger the personalities to come out because we don't even know we have them. And actually, the system doesn't want you to know. They just worked it out for themselves to come out at certain times and you know I always felt like I was eccentric but you know once once it was found out once my system was found out everything discombobulated everything was all out of order and I had to work to bring that back into order so that there was cooperation <clears throat> so um, but you know they they didn't come out around people at church or anything like that and if they did it, they, you know, my, people just thought I was really eccentric, eccentric kind of person, and I'm an outgoing person, you know, I'm very lively, and I'm colorful, so it kind of went with it, you know, but, um, so, <clears throat> <sighs> so now we go into the church arena, um, you know, I believe that most people are good, and even in the church, but many people have been hurt in the church, and I've been one of them. Um, I believe most people on this planet are good. It's just that, you know, we've been so controlled and so taught, uh, you know, how to be divided, how to not love one another, how to not be a community, how, you know, and I, I've, I mean, I keep in, injecting this, but it's, it, it's true, you know, but I really believe in people, you know, and I think that things can change. You know, I really, really do, but we just have to be honest with ourselves. You know, we can't lie to ourselves. And, you know, once we stop lying to ourselves and take responsibility for the fact that we've all turned away, that we've all been wrapped up in this busy, busy way of, of living that keeps us from, from really looking at anything and from really looking at ourselves. And that's where the, you know, the positive side of the pandemic, I'm... I'm, I'm you know, and people have been dying and all that, you know, I, I am very sorry, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to lessen that. I'm just trying to say that if we, you know, take something that's negative and look at the positive part of it, you know, what can we take from that to become better, to keep these things from happening? Um, you know, it really, really starts with us being able to be honest with ourselves and with each other, because that's where all the lies stem from, you know? And there's no shame in not understanding something. There's no shame in not knowing something. There's no shame in being duped. We've all been duped. You know? But anyways, that was an interjection. <laughs> but, um, okay. So, come, come the church thing. So, the thing is, is, you know, I, I, I there, there, for me, I had a great connection with Jesus Christ. Um, but I believe there are many people who have, and I, you know, there are many people who have a great connection with Buddha, with many other ascended masters. You know, these are people who actually lived on earth and, you know, they were able to tap into who they really are. Because, you know, we're multidimensional beings. We are. You know, the, it, it's why we don't use all of our brain. You know, we, we, we're not aware of the power we have and who we are. That's been dumbed down, too. You know, we've been lied to about that as well. And so, you know, people like Jesus Christ and Buddha and, you know, these other um, Allah, you know, uh, they're ascended masters. They came and they, they understood. They came to know who they are. They walked in their power. They mastered themselves. Um, and they made a way for us to know who we are. You know, and anyway, that's what I believe. Um, but my connection was with Jesus Christ, and it was a really close connection. And I don't, I couldn't have healed 
I couldn't have integrated, by the way, I am in integrated, I am one personality now, um, but I couldn't have integrated without Jesus. There was no way. And when I became a Christian at 19, um, you know, I, I had some things happening that I just thought all Christians, it happened to all Christians. I just thought, I just didn't know. I didn't grow up with religion. So, you know, when I would ask God a question, I mean, I would get a scripture and it was the answer. You know, I would go to the Bible and, and there that was the answer. And I just thought that was, you know, how it worked. And come to find out that that's not how it worked. Um, that's not, uh, <laughs> that's not how it worked in general. <laughs> So, you know, people thought I was lying, and, you know, and then they would see, and, and they were just like, wow, why is that happening? I, like, I don't know. So, um, but, you know, I had a lot to work through even before I even knew what my problem was. And he was building trust with me because I could trust no one. I could not trust my, my family. I couldn't trust my, my married family, you know, my kids, my, my husband. I couldn't trust anybody. I couldn't trust people in church. I could trust no one. And I had no trust for anyone. I couldn't even trust myself. But um, I'm going to stop here and we'll do a part two. Um, just because I'm not quite sure like how much time I can put on these for YouTube. I'm new at this. So um, we'll start back up on church and go from there. Okay? See you in a bit.